Well, as we take a look at the market trade action that we saw on Tuesday, we'll call it a mixed day. We had some green on the screen, especially in the wheat market, Chicago, KC, a little more mixed in quarter of beans, mixed activity in livestock, some good strength in feeder cattle as well, ahead of the cattle inventory report. Here to walk through the market trade with us, we welcome in Brian Split, agmarket.net is joining us. Brian, good to catch up with you, sir. It's been a couple of weeks. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, it's been good. Uh, sorry about the glare. Our landlord is uh, replacing the windows in our office for us, but they had to take down all of the window coverings that keeps our, our studio, um, you know, the, the lighting right. So mm -hmm. I know it's kind of off right now. Apologize for that. But yeah, good to be back. Uh, kind of a quiet day today, a little mixed trade. So I was going to say that light, it's just, it, you're, it's shining the glow on you. You're in the spotlight here to talk about these markets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. We'll go with that. No, I, yeah, you mentioned to it. Kind of a quiet day on Tuesday. Um, looking at just this overall picture, feels like a fairly quiet news cycle right now. We're trying to get a handle on South American weather. That seems to be a driver in these markets demand maybe the other driver and then i know on the sidelines we got the fed stuff this week but overall you know just felt very quiet we kind of lost some of that steam after we kind of bought back midday just a, a little back and forth trade especially a quarter beans on tuesday brian yeah you know there was a, a burst of buying across the board this morning uh you know corn rallied eight cents in the first half hour beans took off uh, what almost 20 cents uh, the wheat market was 20 plus cents and then we just sat there uh, but I don't think that buying was just pointed at the ag commodities it seemed like there was buying in commodities in general uh, that's been some of the narrative to start the year Goldman Sachs says hey commodities are going to be the the asset class to outperform and uh, as we finish up the month, I, I wonder if we didn't maybe just see some, some buying in commodities to, uh, to window address positions. You look at orange juice, for example, limit up today, that broke out to the upside. Sugar was very strong. Coffee had a very strong day. Uh, we had the energies come back off of overnight lows. So um, I, I think today just end of month buying here on the idea that, that commodities are going to be something to own for 2023, right or wrong. I'm glad you brought up end of the month because it felt like, too, maybe there was some of that playing out with money flow in and maybe even some profit taking there late in core beans, et cetera. Always good to remember kind of when we get into that end of the month time frame, we can have some of those types of moves in the market. I want to talk a little more closely soybeans, though, what you're seeing on the charts. We were chatting off air this spreading between old and new crop this march contract has just been you know kind of on fire the leader to the upside here obviously we have these drought concerns in argentina we have wetness harvest delay concerns in brazil but we're still like kind of watching this weather forecast feels like it changes day to day and kind of gives us bullish momentum bearish momentum so when you break it down starting old crop first what are you seeing on these soybean charts right now so like you had mentioned, the March contract has been uh, a juggernaut uh, and it has been since the January report relative to the other contracts. So, you know, we've seen some pretty big flat price movement. Uh, you know, last week we came out of the weekend aggressively lower. Uh, we went down and we hit the uptrend from the October lows. That's a very strong uptrend. It's got uh, multiple points of contact. So they bought it last week right where they should have. And, you know, you come off of those lows, 60 plus cents. Um, we came out of this weekend and I think there was some confusion as far as what the calls might be. Some were calling it lower, some higher, some mixed, uh, because I think participants aren't quite sure what is the most important part of the weather. We had Argentina get rain, uh, so that should have been a negative influence. Meal really didn't open very strong. It opened a couple bucks higher coming out of the weekend, but you know, not the type of opening that you would say, oh, well, that's going to lead to beans being up 25, 30 cents by the end of the day. Um, I think the ongoing uh, rain that we have in, in some of the areas of Brazil that are ready for harvest is what's causing this March contract to outperform all the other contracts. And it's not just old crop versus new crop, it's old crop versus other old crop. So you think about March 
versus July, for example, um, March was about a nickel under July going into that January report. And today it traded as much as about 22 over July. So March has gained quite a bit on, on the, the second contract out. Um, and so I think a lot of that has to do with just the idea that we can't get beans harvested in Brazil. Um, the idea of getting quick, quick ship out of Brazil is not realistic. So that's providing some support on the March contract versus everything else at this point. Um, we haven't been able to get through that 1548 and a half high. If we do, um, then maybe this thing just goes towards the upper end of the channel, which is going to be in the low to mid 1570s. Um, there was that peak at 1572. So that could be a, a viable target if we get through 1550. Uh, but if we don't, uh, we may just very well drop back down and revisit that uptrend again, which is going to be around the 1485 to 1490, depending on timing. So, um, you know, it's just we're, we're going, it's a weather market. Uh, we know how those trade. It can be bullish, you know, uh, one day and then midday the next day, the weather models change and they take it all back. And that's the type of atmosphere we're in right now. Well, Brian, thinking about, uh, I think this probably applies especially to old crop, maybe new crop too. Love your thoughts here, but, you know, lock it in some floors and some of these old crop contracts, really good value out there when we have this unknown of a weather market. I think about November new crop though, some farmers may see 1360-ish on the board and they're like, I don't know how much I like that. But then again, a pretty good price level to maybe at least get started with some new crop sales wouldn't it be or or should we be waiting a little bit longer here well we were advocating 14 bucks and protecting 14 bucks uh we've had opportunities to sell 14 bucks since august and that might be part of the difficult factor mentally for the producers they've seen 14 dollars for the last five months and uh, so selling 1350 or 1360 may not be that exciting or that attractive to them. That doesn't mean that it's uh, a bad price to sell. And uh, we could very well go lower here over time. Uh, you know, I know that's been part of the thought process on the bearishness of new crop soybeans is just once this Brazil crop is here and the world buyers can get to it, uh, we're likely to see our export pace drop off dramatically. Uh, but because of the delays, we're just not at that point yet. Um, and so uh, I do want to to really point out and differentiate between the old crop uh, looking pretty good on the chart to the new crop looking not so good on the chart. They're trading two different scenarios right now. Um, I think the new crop has gone back up. It, it retraced about 38% of the break from that high that we had at the end of the year. We've gotten back and retested the 200-day moving average. We visited the downtrend from that high that was made at the end of the year. So we got to get back over 1370 and take out that downtrend in order for the new crop beans to get a little bit of a positive technical outlook. What I can tell you is if we end up taking out those 1330 lows that we scored last week, that's going to look negative on the chart. There is still a gap down at 1269 and a quarter that I think is a very realistic target over the next several months. Um, so maybe at the very least, the idea of having some put coverage at the 1330 strike, not a horrible idea. Sounded like funds as well. Some of that fund money coming in on the day, buyers of corn, beans and bean oil, net sellers of meal. So obviously that's another component too is you know, what is that managed money doing and how is that playing into this market trade? That's always something I think we kind of have to keep an eye on as well. And obviously with the Fed stuff this week, it'll be interesting to see some of that outside market reaction as well. Right. With the Fed, you're undoubtedly going to see some pretty volatile movements in the, uh, the equity indices. You're going to see some movements in the dollar, which will lead to volatility in the other currencies. Uh, so that'll definitely have a hand on things, especially as we start a new month. But, um, you know, you've got the fund uh, manager record long meal right now. And so there's definitely some vulnerability there. If they decide that that story is over, uh, we could see the meal market break rather substantially. Something to point out about meal, uh, we're kind of in a similar scenario to what we saw in August, where the August contract was the front month. 
it left the board, the next contract came on the board, and on a continuous chart, it shows a gap, right? So one contract leaves, the next one comes on at a lower price. And then what we did is two weeks later, we came back up, we tried to fill that gap, we got very close, didn't fill it, and then we rolled over. So we essentially have done the same thing. January traded over 500, it left the board, March became the front month, it gapped lower. Here we are two weeks after that gap, we've come very close to filling the gap within a couple bucks, we couldn't quite do it. So it'll be interesting to see if the inability to fill that gap and, and, and the longer that gap stays open, do we start to see some profit taking in the meal? Um, and that really is just gonna have everything to do with the perception of how long the South American and really the Argentine weather story is gonna last. We are talking today with Brian Split of AngMarket.net, our guest analyst here on Market Talk. Brian, let's move over to corn, and I'd love to get your thoughts, both old and new crop. Uh, starting old crop, to me, it feels like this March contract 690 is this overhead resistance that we're just stuck under. What are you seeing on those old crop corn charts right now? Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, so we had a bullish January report. There's no doubt about that. That was the, uh, you know, the the harvested area is what made that report friendly. Uh, that was an unexpected move from the USDA, and uh, we made a, a move after that report up to 688 and three quarters. So we go to 88 and a half today. We couldn't get through it, um, and then we saw some profit taking there. So. Maybe in the short term, this is a range bound market. I think you're gonna to continue to see buying at the long term uptrend from the July lows. Uh, that's gonna come in in the low to mid 660s, depending on the timing of it. That's a, it's a trend line that's moving up day to day. So uh, I think you're gonna see buyers come in if we get down there. And I think you're gonna to continue to see sellers uh, emerge between the 685 to $7 area, especially uh, when you look at the cash values that are available. Um, one of the things that we've been doing uh, over the last week and a half or so since that January report is selling straddles in the May options. Uh, that's when you sell a call and a put at the same strike price and you collect the premium from both. Uh, and what you're really trying to do there is you're expecting the market to go sideways and you're looking for time value to come out of the put and the call at the same time. Uh, so if you did that the day after the report, just on a, on a non-directional position, you're already ahead about seven or eight cents on that. And that's just from time decay and, and volatility kind of quieting down. Uh, and I think that's going to be the expectation as we move towards that March report, which is going to be acreage intentions and quarterly stocks again. I think because that report was bullish in January, you're going to have buyers coming in on dips. Uh, but at the same time, I think the producer is going to continue to reward the market anytime we see uh, the, the market get into that $7 zone. On the new crop side, I think this could tie into a little bit of wheat discussion too as we think about upcoming acreage in the U.S. We think about fertilizer. Will we see more wheat acres versus, say, corn? Some of that might have depended on fall application. But thinking about new crop, penciling in some of those inputs, you look at new crop corn, What's your thoughts, what you're seeing on the charts, and then also some of the chatter you're hearing in the news and some of that mentality from farmers as we get ready for spring planting, Brian? Well, uh, new crop is, is trending down and, and uh, it has been since the highs that were made last spring. It's a very well-defined downtrend and we've yet to be able to break through that. Um, you think about year over year, our, and we're going to start making our, our spring average price for crop insurance starting tomorrow and through the rest of February. And on the uh, 2022 crop, that was 590. And so we're essentially we're starting at about the same spot. Um, my concern is that, and we've heard some scuttlebutt of different acreage uh, thoughts. Uh, you know, I had a client call me today saying, "Why, well, you know, read somebody says we could have 94, 95 million acres of corn. And, and if that's the case, no one is short enough corn and long enough beans. Uh, that would really be a surprise to me if we came out with acreage intentions at that level. But even if it's 91 million acres and you have a good yield with a, you know, let's just call it a trend line yield, uh, especially if Brazil has a good safrina crop, uh, I think that Brazilian safrina crop would keep our domestic, uh, our, our export demand on edge for a while because they're going to have a, a fresh supply of corn to, to meet the world buyers. Um, then if we have a good crop that backs that up, you're going to have a hemisphere to hemisphere good production cycle for corn. 
And then by fall, we may be talking carry out closer to 1.7 to 2.0 billion bushels. Uh, and that is not $6 corn. So again, it's going to be another situation where it's going to really heavily depend on what type of growing cycle we get this year and whether or not we can uh, raise a good yield. Uh, and, and it seems like that's what's coming down to every year when you're in a, in a tight stock scenario. Um, if we have poor weather and uh, we have subtrend yield, then $6 is too cheap. Uh, so this is what we're going to be looking at. Now, we have to remind the listener that the market really does not care what you paid for your inputs and whether or not you're going to make money on your crop. And sometimes when the market is trending down, they kind of push that and, and stress the producer um, saying, all right, we're not going to let our foot off the gas. We're going to keep pushing it and pushing it. Uh, and we've seen that before. You know, 2020 was a really good example after COVID. They just continue to, to lay on the shorts. And so, uh, again, I think you got to look at your own profitability on your operation, allow some flexibility, uh, give yourself a, a head start of, of uh, maybe paying for some of your inputs um, and, and not get too aggressive in either direction at this phase. Great thoughts for sure on both corn and beans. Brian, wheat market was kind of the strength on Tuesday. Any thoughts with uh, what you're seeing across uh, all three wheat uh, classes here as we work through the week? Wheat's been pretty strong this week. Uh, we've continued to see $8 wheat be a good base of support for hard red. Uh, so we've come off of that $8 area nicely. Uh, on the soft red, we're approaching the downtrend from the October highs. We've yet to take out that downtrend. Uh, that line would come in maybe about a nickel above today's highs, so it'll be a little bit lower for tomorrow's trade. Uh, so that'll be something to watch. I think the fund manager has been covering some wheat shorts. Um, just with some of the, the news over the last week, week and a half of new military equipment going to Ukraine, are we going to see kind of things ramp up again as we get into spring? Uh, you know, we're going to go be going on a year, uh, not too far away, uh, you know, in, in February, that was February 24th, I believe, uh, where we saw the invasion. And, and so it happens at that time of year because, you know, the, the weather cycle allows for, for troop movement. So, um, I think that's the concern as we kind of get back into February is do we start to see the kinetic activity increase in the Black Sea region? And maybe at the very least, the fund manager just doesn't want to have as short of a position just in case. Um, but we are seeing a production cycles increase. High prices have definitely uh, caused other world producers to, to uh, produce quite a bit of wheat. Australia is going to have a great crop. Russia still has an awful lot of wheat. So these are going to be the things that we're watching here over the next month or two. I want to touch on livestock real quick before we run out of time, especially this cattle market. I know feeder cattle had a strong day Tuesday. Live cattle mixed and choppy felt like we're squaring up positions ahead of that cattle inventory report Tuesday afternoon, which we are anticipating, don't have it in front of us yet, anticipating a record low beef cow herd. I just wonder your thoughts in this cattle market here, just the activity we've seen. Does it feel like we're trying to maybe bake in some of those estimates from that cattle inventory report, Brian? I think so. And like you'd mentioned, that is the concern is that we'd have a record low beef cow herd and that could very well come to fruition. Uh, it looks to me like the chart did break out to the upside yesterday. Um, I would call that formation an ascending triangle. So we kind of had a flat base uh, above the market, and then we had an uptrend below the market, and then we squeezed through that flat top. Uh, and so what you're supposed to do technically is you take that measurement from uh, the flat top to the lowest trough in that uptrend, uh, and then you measure that higher. So that would project the April contract up to about 166. Uh, and I think that's a pretty reasonable target, especially if we get confirmation that the beef cow herd is uh, at, at that, that record low uh, level. Um, but undoubtedly, we are trying to price some of that in ahead of that. Um, I would say that if the market sees some pullbacks, I would venture to say you're going to continue to see buying come in at that trend uh, it's got very strong points of contact on there, multiple points. Um, you know, you're probably your biggest risk in the short term is going to be just something happen in the macroeconomics. Uh, if we see a major washout in equities, something like that. But without that happening, I think you're going to continue to see the cattle market uh, steady to stronger over the next couple months. 
30 seconds on hogs. I don't know if we either, either one of us has anything positive to say about this hog market, Brian. It's just been taking a beating and been tough to look at. But any thoughts you have with what we've been seeing chart-wise in hogs? Yeah, the February contract absolutely sucks. Uh, looking at April right now, maybe that one is showing some signs that we've made some kind of a low last week. Uh, we had a you know very strong reversal last week. Unfortunately, we really just haven't seen any follow through. Uh, I think if you can get through the high that we made coming out of the weekend, uh, or I should say uh, last week, that 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 spike high that we had last week, I think you could start to see some technical buying, and then maybe that would confirm that we did make a low. Uh, but you know, with with the whole idea, is, you know, and again, the the talk about commodities being one of the the strongest asset classes, and a lot of that is. Uh, because of the expectation of what's going to happen with China reopening. And I don't know, I would like to think that if that's the case, China reopening, that that should be pretty beneficial to hogs. Uh, we just haven't seen that coming in the marketplace yet. But I, I've got my fingers crossed. I do think that we made a strong low last week. We just need to start getting some follow through. And I think once we do, you're going to start seeing some very strong technical action. I think that's a great spot for us to wrap up. And I know you guys have your conference in Nashville next week at the Grand Hyatt. I'm looking forward to being there, seeing you. And I know folks can reach out to you guys for market advice at agmarket.net or 844-4-AG-MARKET as well. And Brian, appreciate the time as always, sir. We'll see you uh, next week in Nashville. Thanks so much. Sounds great. Thanks, Jesse. See you there. That's going to do it for Market Talk here today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.